It's not been able to convince people that it's important to do that. And I think so, sometimes recognize that in many instances, we probably have to use the strong arm of the law to deal with offenders who continue to change their, to, to practice negative behaviors as regards to waste, waste disposal. We're making too many demands on the environment, Mr. Fabian cautioned. We're making a serious mistake in, in, in thinking that we have a lot of space. Dominica, I must say, is a very fragile ecosystem, very, very fragile. And if we don't manage it well, we might not have a country which we can sell as the ecotourism destination for visitors because we'll soon be destroying the same, the same environment which we're trying to sell. I must say too that while some people are trying their best to, uh, in, trying their best to ensure that this, this environment is kept in a pristine manner, others are really going out of their way to destroy it. And we have to take, sit down and take a serious look at what is going on. Currently, the government is looking at finding a new landfill site and new skips are being placed around the island. This is Wendy Ostry reporting. The banana industry's negotiations with Geist over a new contract could be over as soon as next week. Dr. J. Bernard Yankee, chairman of the negotiating team, says that he is satisfied with many of the achievements. We have succeeded in a number of very important areas like removal of exclusivity, a new pricing um, arrangement, um, looking at the whole question of West Indies shipping and loading as a matter for us to take over at some point in time, because there are some cost savings can be made in those areas. Um, the question of shipping, looking at shipping, uh, these, are, these are areas that we have made some progress in. Lack of information from the negotiating team led to rumors of incompetence, but Dr. Yankee says otherwise. We have a very formidable team, and I don't think that we have left anything untouched in terms of our, the positions we have taken. If we certainly were a simple team, we would have backed down long ago. The chairman, who is also director of the OECS Economic Affairs Secretariat, believes that the restructuring of the banana industry was very important. A number of ideas came about that the industry needs to be restructured to make it more efficient and more responsive, to remove bureaucracy and, 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 and overburden the administration, a more responsive extension service, a greater cost-effectiveness in the system, uh, a cl closer collaboration to strategic planning and targeting of farmers to do things that they should do. But that was not good enough. We had taken a number of decisions, you know, how we should do, what we should do. But one had to get down and examine them to the nitty-gritty to see how you can implement them. And we appointed a team of consultants who have just presented their draft report and is entitled Report on Implementation Strategies for the Winwood Island Banana Industry, which I have with me, but it's which now is being discussed. And hopefully, after all the BGAs have discussed them, the governments have discussed them, and the consultants have been drawn in to sort of review them, we will have something that will be a blueprint. And the farmers being involved at that level, that it will be a blueprint for execution. Government's chief welfare officer has said that he is unable to determine whether there has been a, any marked decrease in the number of cases of child abuse in Dominica. In 1992, the rising incidence of sexual abuse of minors prompted Parliament to amend the Sexual Offences Act, raising the age of consent from 14 to 16. Between 1980 and 1985, there were five reported cases of child abuse. The number jumped to 127 in 1990, 174 in 1991, and 210 in 1992. But has the amended act served as a deterrent? To, to see, uh, because we are still um, seeing the many cases going before the court, um, uh, the, we, we see that and we do know based on the reports we are getting that there is a heightened awareness that, that many more um, reports are, are coming forward and uh, the public is, is very sensitized and will willingly report cases 
and uh, there is also a coordinated approach, a better coordinated approach in, in, in the handling of, 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 of sexual abuse and other forms of abuse in terms of uh, the main agencies dealing with that, in police, nurse, um, welfare departments dealing with, with that. So there's that heightened uh, awareness. But does this heightened awareness go far enough in dealing with the situation which in essence scars a child for life? State Attorney Heather Felix indicates that there are stiff penalties for persons convicted of such offenses. Where a girl is below the age of 14, the charge is framed as defilement of a girl under the age of 14. And the penalty which, a which um, attaches to that offense is life imprisonment. Where there's another charge of defilement of girl between 14 and 16 years of age, and there's a penalty of seven years, that's a maximum penalty of seven years. It is interesting because in this case, the only defense the, at the, um, the accused could possibly have is that he had reasonable cause to believe that girl was of or above the age of 16 years. There's another offense which is called um, the charge householder permitting defilement of a, of, of a young girl in the premises, on his premises. If the girl is under the age of 14, the penalty which, atta which attaches to that offense is five years. And if the girl is of or above the age of 14 and under 16, liable to two years imprisonment. Again, a sufficient defense is that the householder had reasonable cause to believe that that girl was of or above the age of 16. Chief Welfare Officer Anthony says that while there are limitations, even now new considerations are being contemplated, including the idea of a family court. Two things are happening right now. Right now, um, the same act, the Sexual Offences Act, is again being, being, being looked at closely. A committee is in place and that committee is, is examining um, uh, that act and, see, and, and try to make it a bit more comprehensive. Areas that are, are, are not included in that act are being examined and, and there's the possibility in the end that that act will definitely be uh, more comprehensive. And in terms of the family court, um, representation has been made to government and government is in fact examining the, the idea of a family court. Uh, it is a long process and uh, the recommendation came from many quarters. Government responded to that, to those recommendations and uh, um, it has been looked at. There are definitely loopholes in the law, which is why a committee has been formed and we're in the process now of revising that Sexual Offences Act and they, we're making, we want to make it much more modern and we have, there are several new offenses created to catch any kind of sexual offense, any kind. The new legislation is going to be much more gender neutral and so the same offense which can be possibly committed against a female can also be committed against a male. Minister of Education Senator Rupert Sorendo believes the issue of the junior secondary program stoppage at the St. Mary's Primary could have been avoided with a temporary accommodation arrangement involving a shift system. I'm very disappointed to learn that that suggestion and that option was in fact rejected outright. And I still cannot understand what the rationale for that was. I still cannot understand it. I know that the parents of the students who are out on the street now and who could have easily been accommodated in the afternoons were in favor of it. And I really don't understand how the other parents of the, the students in the lower grades that would not be affected at all because they would be in school from 8 to 8 to 1 and they would not be affected. And I don't understand how those parents could have objected or even that the administration of the school was not able to show the parents how having their, that their children was, uh, were not going to be affected. And if there was any concern about staff and deployment of staff. Now, these are administrative matters that can be resolved in the same way that we in the ministry resolve these problems where we have students on shift. Minister Sorendo indicated he would be convening an emergency meeting this afternoon with the board of the Roman Catholic Schools to express the ministry's concern and see how the board could intervene and look at the situation in a fresh light. In tonight's regional news headlines, the Caribbean Tourism Association's annual conference is underway in Jamaica. 
Liat's chairman feels the airline could be facing collapse. David Thompson has been sworn in as the opposition leader in Barbados. Uncertainty for more than 2,000 school children in Barbados. And the hijab row continues in Trinidad and Tobago. We'll have details in just a moment. Some people take the business of flying and crawling insect control a lot more seriously than others. That's why these insecticides kill 90% of all household insects within 30 seconds. Shell talks, a better way to protect your home. Don't miss the White Akubuli Dance Theatre Company at the Arawak House of Culture, September 16th, 17th, and 18th. Tickets are $12 in advance and $15 at the door. Matinee adults, $10, children, $5. Tickets available at Frontline and CBs. Be there. Taking a look at the region, the Caribbean Tourism Organization, CTO, opened its 18th annual conference in Jamaica yesterday. The theme for the conference is developing a quality tourism product. 900 delegates from the Caribbean and other regions are attending the workshop, the conference, sorry. Deborah Hicklin reports. The Caribbean is the region most dependent on tourism in the entire world. In fact, 25% of the value of total exports of goods and services come from tourism. This is why the CTO is finding it important to take a look at how to increase its market share by diversifying its products and, of course, integration of the Caribbean as a single destination. In his opening address, Prime Minister P.J. Patterson brought home the importance of Caribbean integration in a sustained and collaborative effort toward the expansion and prosperity of the tourism product. And I would like to suggest to this group that instead of each of us scrambling to compete for a small share of the market, we combine our efforts to secure a significant share of the global market. I believe these opportunities present themselves at a time when global economic trends show the developed countries forming themselves into trading blocks and large corporations consolidating their forces through strategic alliances. The Caribbean, he said, with a combined advertising budget of 40 million US dollars, could give much stronger competition to other tourism products around the world. The new chairman of the Caribbean Tourism Organization is our own Minister of State for Tourism, Francis Teller. He says marketing is the main thrust of the CTO, but other decisions have been made so far. One of them is the planning for restructuring of the organization's constitution. What kind of changes are we looking at? Um, possibly more involvement by the directors of tourism and the technocrats in the organization and the running of it and less involvement of the political directorate. Already the CTO has made other decisions on cruise shipping to be disclosed to the public once they have been discussed with the cruise ship industry. Foreign. Other marketing strategies are also being developed including the planning of an exclusive advertising booklet, the Caribbean Vacation Planner. As the conference continues, the Prime Minister aptly summed up the feeling as Jamaica hosts the 18th CTO conference. 
Truman, Jamaica, no problem. Reporting from Ocheria, I'm Deborah Hickling from JBC News. Democratic Labour Party DLP leader David Thompson is now the official leader of the opposition in Barbados. He was sworn in by Governor General Dame Nita Bino at Government House. Novelin Brewster reports. I, David John Howard Thompson, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, according to law, so help me God. DLP leader David Thompson taking the oath of office as leader of the majority opposition. Mr. Thompson later signed the oath before accepting the instruments of office from Governor General Dame Nita Barrow. The ceremony was witnessed by his wife Mara. Speaking to the news media afterward, Mr. Thompson said he would name a deputy leader in due course. I, I should like to, to have an idea based on the selections that the Prime Minister makes and, and then we will work on the Shadow Cabinet from there. Mr. Thompson has promised to make this the best opposition this country has ever known. We have uh, four of us who've had considerable experience, not only in cabinet, but in relation to parliamentary procedure. And we are going to do the job which the people have elected us to do as an opposition and to ensure that the concerns of the people are uh, put to the forefront and that the issues are dealt with in Parliament and that the government does its job and implements those things which it promised to implement. It's the first time since independence there will be two elected oppositions in the lower chamber. The National Democratic Party is the second one. Its leader, Dr. Richie Haynes, was the only NDP candidate to capture a seat in Tuesday's poll. Novelin Brewster, CBC News. The new school year in Barbados begins on Monday, but there are some students who are unsure of what their future holds. These are the 2,500 young people who are unable to gain entry into the island's lone polytechnic, the Samuel Jackman Prescott Polytechnic. Jennifer Blackman explains. With the Samuel Jackman Prescott Polytechnic receiving more applications than it has places, this year, 3,000 applications for 500 places. The screening process is very intense for everyone who applies. I wouldn't say that the top student gets the, the, the priority placing. I mean, it depends on how the person performs at an interview. You may have a student, a student coming in with six O levels, wants to do electronics. But on completion of the course, he wants to go into nursing. We would not select that person. Mr. Callender says that one of the ways the Polytechnic can remedy the situation is distance teaching, which would involve liaising with village workshops. This particular plan would mean placing students in the workshops to gain practical experience, while the Polytechnic monitors their progress. Linking up with secondary schools to introduce auto mechanics and masonry to the curriculum is another probable answer to the problem. And what about the students who did not gain admission? Quite a large number would go to the training board and uh, I guess others um, go to all level and so forth. The principal has stated that if someone reapplies and this information reaches admissions, he or she is given priority. Jennifer Blackman, CBC News. The simmering hijab controversy has taken another interesting twist. To two Muslim students of Bishop Anstey's High School in Port of Spain, Trinidad, were ordered to replace their hijab and return to schools with shorter skirts. This from a school that was believed to be taking a more liberal outlook on the issue. Errol Pilgrim has more. Because of this long skirt and the Muslim head covering known as a hijab, Naima Muwakil is one of the two Muslim students who suddenly became the center of attraction at Bishop's Anstey High School today. The other girl, Miriam Mohammed, a Form 3 student at the school, was not available for comment. Naima is 13 years old and a Form 2 student at Bishops. She has been attending the school for the past year and until today never ran into any difficulty that would be caused by a long skirt and a head covering. Okay, this afternoon, um, Ms. Ramsey called me and Miriam and I on the PA system and told us to come down to her office 
and we went down and she told us as of tomorrow we have to wear a short white scarf and shorten our school skirt. The principal of the school, Mrs. Ramsey, could not be contacted by TTT News. However, Naima's father, Salim Muakil, is incensed over what he has seen as this sudden change of heart by Bishop's Ansty High School. He says a year ago there was a bit of difficulty when the school tried to have his daughter transferred to the Woodbrook Junior Secondary School. But all that was sorted out and Naima was allowed to wear her long skirt and her hijab without any objection. Mr. Muakil says he does not intend to comply with the wishes of the school. He says this now involves a question of an apparent infringement of his daughter's fundamental human rights. And uh, you're saying that your daughter is going to be as dressed as she is with the hijab and uh, the long skirt tomorrow morning. Exactly so. This is a modest dress. Mm -hmm. And while Pantina, they are calling for modesty of young, more young people on one side, they are saying immodesty on the other side. Raise the skirt, shorten the skirt and take off. I mean, what is this call they are making? What is this about? Mr. Muakil says he has always tried to protect his daughter from the trauma that the controversy involves. And he is anticipating some kind of confrontation with the authorities when he brings Naima to school tomorrow dressed as she usually is. Errol Pilgrim, TTT News. Back home here in Dominica, new prospects and opportunities are about to open up for Dominican footballers. Trinidad-based Carib Brewery is about to establish the Carib Football Series locally. Here to launch this new initiative, promotions manager Keston Nanko says that talented young players from the various leagues should seize this opportunity and graduate onto the international scene. We see this as, as a corporate sponsor, as creating opportunities, not just educational opportunities where young players can get scholarships because we're going to see a lot of scouts coming down from North America and, and around looking for talented players. And just as we in Trinidad have players such in the caliber of Dwight York and the Latipes and, and the Shaka Hislops and they we are certain that this is going to give the people, the young people in Dominica, the kind of incentives to work towards achieving those levels. The U.S. 230,000 annual sponsorship deal involves the national leagues of Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Antigua, Dominica, Grenada, Montserrat, St. Lucia, St. Kitts Nevis. It will run for two years in the first instance. An official launch is carded for tomorrow afternoon at the Fort Young Hotel. Among dignitaries scheduled to attend tomorrow's function will be Harold Taylor, General Secretary of the Caribbean Football Union. We'll be back in just a moment. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Thank goodness there's new life boys protect them against harmful germs. New Life Boy has triclosan, a strong, effective antibacterial ingredient that removes harmful germs which can cause skin infections while giving you that refreshing and invigorating feeling of cleanness that sells Life Boy. Life Boy, for active protection against germs. Someone wins a free pickup in the Burton Jupiny Giant Draw. This Giant Draw 94 win two vehicles free. And you are in when you buy from a range of the finest home appliances. World famous brands, Edessa, Murphy Richards, for less. Save money with the Burton Easy Payment Plan. Up to 24 months to pay. And with every $100 purchase, a free ticket for Giant Draw 94. Prizes throughout the year. And the grand prize of not one, but two vehicles free. A loaded Nissan pickup for you and a Another vehicle for your little friend. This giant drone 94 Burton and Company gives you more. Before we close, another look at tonight's major stories. Two Dominicans escaped serious injury in an accident under the Point Michel Cliff. 
The director of the Economic Affairs Secretariat for the OECS believes the future of economic diversification in the region may be in the small business sector. The Association of Local Authorities is formulating plans to bring communities in Dominica closer together and football in, in Football in Dominica is to get a big boost with tomorrow's launch of a new football series. Regionally, the Caribbean Tourism Association's annual conference is continuing in Jamaica, and David Thompson has been sworn in as Barbados's opposition leader. That concludes tonight's edition of the news. On behalf of all of us at Martin Television, good night. The pediatric and neonatal wing of the Princess Margaret Hospital. The project began in January of this year and is expected to be completed early next year. When the old wing was demolished, the section of the hospital had to be redone and the number of prefabricated buildings erected to temporarily house maternity, pediatric and neonatal. The new maternity wing is being funded by the government of Dominica and the Dominica Social Security. Meantime, survey works have begun for the construction of a new surgery wing to the Princess Margaret Hospital. The government of France is providing a grant for the construction of that wing. Prime Minister Dame Eugenia Charles and the French ambassador to Dominica, Madame Sylvie Alvarez, recently signed the exchange of notes for that project. The government of Dominica remains committed to providing quality and affordable health care for all Dominicans in suitable environment. It is expected that as time goes on, further improvement works will take place at the Princess Margaret Hospital. Meantime, another project visited was the multi-million dollar fisheries development project at the Bayfront. The project, which is being funded by the Japanese government through grant funding, is intended to improve the lot of fishermen here. The building and other fisheries-related facilities will provide refrigeration, storage, mooring, boat repairs, and a fish market, as well as fish processing plant. Dominica is coming to the assistance of sister island St. Lucia in the wake of Tropical Storm Debbie, which caused widespread destruction to that country on Friday. Reports from St. Lucia indicate that there was loss of life as well as severe structural damage to the island as a result of heavy rains. By information released by the Office of Disaster Preparedness St. Lucia at 7 this morning, the indication is confirmed that